I'm reading this morning from John chapter 1 uh, from the NIV uh, translation and uh, beginning at verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made that had been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Glennis. Very impressive. All right. <clears throat> what have we got here? What are we looking at? John 1, 1 to 8. And, and in actual fact, it sits, it couches in 1 to 18. That's a section that, that's just rich with theological thinking and is... Uh, it's just a wonderful text, and it reads like a, like a prologue, like a preamble, yeah? And, you know, this is to, to the whole of the Gospel of John, really, when you, when you look at the Gospel of John. So let's see what we can find here. First off, it weds theology and poetry. It, it is poetic and written like a prose. You know, you know, a prose, it's sort of repetitious and sort of poetic style and form. And like poetry, it packs layers of meaning in a word or phrase. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word uh, was God. These few words have inspired theologians to write really impressive books an artist to, to sculpture and paint and, and for musicians to compose, for all us punters to get a better understanding of uh, Jesus in a, in a profoundly larger way. And among these themes that are introduced are, and I've got about a dozen listed here that sort of just keep bopping up through the Gospel of John, but it, it's really rich with theological depth and understanding. So let's have a bit of a grab about them. The pre-existence of the word. So that's the uh, first couple of verses that Glenis read out to us. And it pops up again in chapter 17. God, word, father, son, is distinctive but yet one. Verse 1, chapter 17. Uh, Jesus is God, verse 1, and 18, and also jumps into chapter 20 of the Gospel of John. Life, this emphasis of life, verse 4, comes in John 3.16, and chapter 5, chapter 6, etc. Light is a big theme here. Verse 4, 9, popped up again in a couple other chapters. The struggle between light and darkness is big. Verse 5, also in chapter 3, the power of the light over darkness, verse 5, also is present in chapter 12. Where are we? 8, up to this one. All right. The relationship between Jesus and John the Baptist, we got that in verses 6 to 8. And we also find it later on in chapter 1. And number 9, rejection, verse 11, and chapter 4, and then 10, the miracle of being able to see God's glory. And that's outside of our eight verses that we looked at this morning, but is present in verse 14 and in chapter 12. And, and for the sake of this exercise, the last one, Jesus is the only Son of God. And that is in verse 18 and John 3.16. So the overarching theme of this gospel is that the Word who was in the beginning with God and the Word was God, in our first verse, became flesh, live among us, full of grace and truth, verse 14. So, it is because the word was present with God in the beginning that Jesus would later be able to say, and he says this in chapter 8, and I'll quote you, 
I say these things which I have seen with my father and I know him. And that comes up in verse 55 of 8. So Jesus alone reveals God with such clarity and because he alone has shared the intimacy with God and which there are no secrets and it would appear to be no disagreements, which is astonishing that any relationship can have no disagreements. Moses heard God on Mount Sinai, but he couldn't, he couldn't see God. He read the words of engraved on the tablets of stone, but he didn't produce them. The word, on the other hand, was present with God from the beginning and participated fully in every stage of creation. And that's the other part of our text. It's so rich with the creation Genesis story. In the beginning was the word. This Greek word of an ark, beginning, was a word, logo or logos, depending on the emphasis, understanding the Greek, which is not my thing. Some of you are better at it than me. And the word was with God, Theon, God. These just overlapping thoughts. And from a different version, verse 2, the same was in the beginning with God. Verse 3, all things were made through him. Without him was not anything made that has been made. Verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men and women. And verse 5, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness have an overcomer. In the beginning, the Jewish people know their books and they hear a few words and they'll tell you straight away where this is coming from. In the beginning, ah, Genesis. Just like when we sing a hymn here and the first few words come out and you guys, because you know your song, you go, ah, I know that song. It's the same thing. It's a, a, a default response. The gospel begins with the exact words by design because the prologue models itself on the creation account. You see, both Genesis and the prologue preamble are accounts of creation of God's world and God's word. Both speak of darkness and light coming into being at the word of God to penetrate, to overcome the darkness. Genesis, John, the presence of Jesus. Both speak of life. In Genesis, God speaks and the word brings man to life. In the prologue, the word of God brings eternal life to humanity. And each full gospel traced Jesus back to this particular beginning. Pretty cool, isn't it? Now let's put aside the wedding of theology and poetry and attempt to speak to context. And I love this bit, this context to which John is writing this gospel. The Christian movement, as we know it, began in Judaism. All the first participants were Jewish. In Jewish language, with Jewish thought and Jewish processes, thought processes. But we're soon, over the next 30 years, in a gent becoming of the Gentile world. And it travels all over Asia Minor, Greece, and arrives in Rome in AD 60. And when we talk about the first century church, when we talk about this development of the Christian movement, there must have been hundreds of Gentiles, Greeks, to every one Jew within the faith community. How did that happen? The theme was about a coming Messiah. And yet the Greeks had never heard of a Messiah or the need for a Messiah. This, was a, this sort of thinking was at the centre of Jewish thought and expectation. So how was it that Christianity was presented to the Greek world in a relevant way? And then along came John about 100 AD, living in Ephesus. I reckon he thought a lot about this problem. He lived with 
Greeks. He hung out with Greeks. He lived in Ephesus in a Greek city. He was savvy about Greek, Greek thought. And he was also aware that Jewish ideas would have been a bit weird for the Greeks at times. And I reckon John had a light bulb moment. For in both Greek and Jewish thought, there existed this concept of word. Here was an idea that could effectively speak to both cultures that related to both Greek and Jewish heritage that could be understood. For the Jew, word was not just about a sound or a... um, It had an independent existence. It it was powerful. It meant something. It did things. And according to one writer, Professor John Patterson, the spoken word to the Hebrew was fearfully alive. Flies, and the metaphor, flies like an arrow to its target. A really nice description, isn't it? For that reason, the Hebrew was sparing of words, fewer than 10,000. In contrast, however, the Greek... The Greek speech had 200,000 words. How's that for two opposing positions? Then we have the Greeks. In Greek thought, the idea of of power of the word was entrenched in philosophical thinking regarding this word logos. Logos. In their world of chaos and messiness and power plays, logos gave order to all things. Logos was the word, is judge, and truth. The mind of God is controlling the world and every person in it. So, John writes, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Suddenly John's fascinating attention to emphasis of Word was, um, is, with, in the beginning, Word, this repetition gets traction. It gets traction for his listeners. Without him, nothing is made. In him is life. Is light for all men and women. Shining in the darkness, even though the darkness didn't get it or necessarily understand it. The Greeks are presented with a relevant thought-provoking case that they could actually engage with. Well, that's my little bit of subjective exegetical exercise on our text for today. So I want to go back to our first question, and we've got an image up on the screen. I'll just tell you about this image. Um, Karen and I had the luxury of travelling to Cairo, in Egypt back in 2015, we visited some friends that were working with InterServe and are working with refugees. Now, this chapel, you know, the old 1950s, 60s Bible story books, you know, with the, the sandstone blasted looking buildings of the first century with the flat roofs and the external steps. Well, we were in Cairo and we went with our friends to a Coptic retreat centre, two and a half hours out of Cairo in the desert. Cairo's in the middle of the desert. You only drive three minutes and you're in the desert and we drive two and a half hours and we're driving down the road and there's nothing out there and all of a sudden there's this oasis and a big cyclone fence around it because security's big. And right around this fence, with a couple of hectares, gum trees surrounding the place. Who would have thought... Anyway, we went in there and those type of buildings that you see in the Bible stories were all around this place. They had a big pool. It was a beautiful location. And they had a chapel. And this is their chapel. And, uh, and, and for Wayne and, and for Kevin and you guys down there and Anna, no need for tech people down at this chapel. There's no pull-down screen, no video camera. There's no power there. All that light is candlelight. And uh, we went in for a service and... Uh, you sat on these little wooden stools, so that was a bit of a logistical challenge. It felt like a praying mantis with my knees and my ears. And the Coptic brother walked in and just handed out these little slips. And they were references for, for, for Bible verses. And then he sat at the front on his stool, and then nothing happened. And then suddenly someone stood up and read in their native tongue. 
the verse that they were given. And they'd sit down and then someone would sing. And everyone would join in from where they were. And then they'd go silent again. And then that's what happened. And I got handed a slip, so when it seemed like it was a long pregnant pause, not knowing what I was doing, I read in English. And it seemed to work. And so we did this for 50 minutes. Singing, hearing scripture read, people praying. And then it just seemed to finish. And then the brother gave a nod and we could all leave. How's that for an innovative service? So no need for tech people, no need for too much preparation, just a few slips of paper and away we went. So why am I telling you this story? I'm just using it as an image to the questions that are going to roll through now. Thanks, Wayne. So back to my opening line at the start of the service. What New Year resolution did you make? What hopes and dreams do you have for 2021? Are there new beginnings anticipated? What are you pondering? What are these beginnings? And the second part of that is, how could your faith become more relevant in the circles in which you mix? As we bring closure to one year for all the logistical challenges, for the things that did work or were successful in your life and the things that fell over, how do we grow? How do we learn? What does that mean as we move into the next year? And I want to encourage people to, at home, over lunch, chat about it over the lunch table, over your salad rolls or whatever you're having. As you ponder during the week, what does this mean for you? How will your faith be evident? How is it expressed? And as we, as we embrace this wonderful, poetic, prose style of, of, of uh, John 1 to 8, recognising the layers of meaning and the richness of, of God's in, deliberateness in the world of creation and new beginnings in Christ, how is that reflected in new beginnings in our lives? Whatever stage of life you're at. Whatever stage of life you're at. Okay. Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for the opportunity to gather. We thank you, Lord, for the richness of uh, John's writing style, the inspiration that he had, the, the, the richness of, of the overlay with the creation imagery. Uh, Lord, for the message of, of who Jesus is and his place in the timeless relationship that brings new starts, new beginnings, divided time and his intervention into the physical world. We pray, Lord, that we can experience that afresh for ourselves and for 2021, how do we best honour and continue to serve you? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.